Back in the 80s and 90s, the Bronx was a breeding ground for some of the most ruthless gangs in the nation's history. Among one of the most dangerous ones was SMM. At the head of this organization was a man who has gone down in the history of New York City street life as a legend, and his name was Pistol Pete Rolock. Hailing from the notoriously unsafe Soundview projects of the Bronx, Pistol Pete became associated through his father as a boy with world-famous heroine kingpin Nicky Barnes, also known as Mr. Untouchable. Although his mother tried to raise him to follow a different path than his hustler father, even putting her son in Catholic school as a boy, Pete was always drawn to the ruthlessness and the relentless pursuit of power, which landed him his first serious prison sentence at Rikers Island when he was just 19 years old. Nicknamed for his ability to draw his gun faster than anyone else in the city, Pete fell into a crew of bloods during his prison stay who tried to recruit him into the gang, but not one to settle for being a follower. Pete said he would only join the gang if he was allowed to have his own set, and that's how SMM was born. Upon his release from prison, Pistol Pete continued to add to his already insane body count, which was rumored by many to have reached over three dozen. As the leader of one of the first blood sets to distribute dope and dope outside state boundaries in the middle of the epidemic, Pistol Pete often tagged along on out-of-state trips with his crew as an enforcer to make sure his shipment reached Pennsylvania and North Carolina safely. This would turn out to be his downfall, for despite his almost supernatural ability to dodge hit charges, a trip to North Carolina gone wrong in 93 would later come back to haunt him. As of today, Pete Rolock has been in solitary confinement for the past 28 years since he was just 20 years old, in conditions that his lawyer have argued are completely inhumane. Because he orchestrated several hits from behind bars during his first few stints in prison, the Bureau of Prisons has refused to let him into general population, only allowing him one hour of solitary exercise per day. Since his sentencing, Pete has accepted the hand he was dealt and made the best of his situation, even publishing a novel with the help of his family and earning his GED by taking education courses through closed circuit television. To this day, the legend of Pistol Pete and the chokehold he had on the Bronx at such a young age continues to influence NYC street life. This is his story. Peter Pistol Pete Rolock was born in the notoriously dangerous Southview projects of the Bronx in 1974. His father, Leonard Rolock, was a notorious hustler who was said to be associated with legendary heroine kingpin Nicky Barnes. For the first few years of his childhood, Pete's mother put up with Leonard's criminal behavior. But when Pete turned three years old, she decided it wasn't good for her son to grow up in a violent environment like that and left her husband, who ended up catching a 50-year prison sentence for dope charges pretty soon after. During his early childhood, Pete didn't give his mother any problems. She put him in Catholic school and did her best to raise him to be different from his father. But when Pete got into Stevenson Public High School, as a teenager, things changed for the worse. With an unconscious adoration for his father, Pete was soon sticking up people on the streets and chasing money, women, and power in the most dangerous ways he could find. When he was 17, his mother could no longer control him and sent him to live with his father's friend, George Wallace. Despite his mother's good intention, this only made things worse. And pretty soon, George was supplying Pistol Pete and his friends with dope for him and his friends to sell all over the city. As a natural leader and a remorseless hitman, Pete pretty soon had a crew of underlings to help him transport crazy amounts of dope inside and outside of NYC. One thing that really stood out about Pete is that while most gang leaders delegate the most gruesome tasks to their crew, Pistol Pete wasn't about that life. He was by far the most vicious member of his own organization. In his early days, Pistol Pete had a fascination for the glamour of Italian organized crime, modeling his crew after the mafia. Pete's crew soon became the first gang in the Bronx to transport dope out of town, which made him a millionaire before 20 and earned him all kinds of shout outs and mentions in the music of the era. Often tagging along with his crew as an enforcer on out of state trips, Pistol Pete and his boys would transport eight to 10 kilograms of dope to Pittsburgh and Charlotte, North Carolina at a time. 
For a while, it seemed like nothing could go wrong for Pete. He had the women, the money, and the power. For fun, he would often stick up people at the legendary Tunnel nightclub in Chelsea and would often hold what he would call wet t-shirt contests, where he and his crew would try to shoot their assailants enough times to get their shirts soaked red. Unfortunately for Pete, his golden years would be cut short real quick after an out-of-town delivery trip in 93 turned sour. As usual, Pete went on that trip as an enforcer. This time, a dealer owed him $90,000 and was late on his payment. When the dealer failed to pay, Pistol Pete threatened to execute his wife and the cops eventually caught wind of his plans. Even though they booked him and his crew for transporting dope in the van they were driving, he was able to walk by giving a false name and continued on his dope dealing and hit spree for a few more months. In 1995, however, Pete's life went downhill for good. Around that time, Pistol Pete and Carlton Hines, a local basketball player with a scholarship to Santa Cruz, had some serious beef. Although Hines had a promising future, he had one fit in the dope game and another in basketball. And after allegedly failing to pay Pete some money he owed him, Pete hit him outside a car stereo shop on Boston Road, also injuring his friend, Carlos Mestri, in April of 1994. In an effort to tie off the loose ends of his previous hit, Pistol Pete hit Carlos Mestri later as he walked out of a hip hop store in the Bronx known as the Jew Man. In 1995, Pete was arrested at Grant's tomb in Harlem for the hit of Carlton Hines, a charge he eventually ended up beating because there were no eyewitnesses to the crime. He hit the only one, remember? Still, he was required to do an eight month mandatory sentence at Rikers Island for possessing a gun. This was another major turning point for Pistol Pete as during that stay at Rikers, he was recruited into the Bloods, who gave him his own set at his request. According to several sources, Pete got the name the Money Murder from an MC Poo song of the same name, and once the eighth month sentence was up, his mom bailed him out, allowing Pete to begin one of the most gruesome sprees of his life in which he recruited hundreds of people from the Bronx as possible into his crew. With the you're either with me or against me mentality, Pistol Pete made sure the streets of the Bronx were soaked in red, but unknown to him, those would be the last two weeks of his life that he'd spend on the streets. Later that year, Pete was booked into custody after the feds matched up his prints in the NCIC computer database with the drug-filled van from his 1993 trip to North Carolina. And with the help of David Gonzalez's testimony, one of Pete's former associates, he was transferred to the Charlotte Mecklenburg County Jail in Charlotte, North Carolina to await trial. At just over 20 years old, he would be spending the rest of his life behind bars. But for Pete, being jailed up didn't mean he couldn't continue to be the leader of SMM. In 1997, after he was transferred into a jail in Carolina to face his charges, he sent a coded letter to his girlfriend that led to the hits of two men during an annual Thanksgiving football game between residents of the South View and Castle Hill houses in the Bronx. To this day, the infamous incident is referred to as the Thanksgiving Day Hits in the Bronx. As it was later revealed, Pete was worried that another one of his associates, David Twin Mullins, was cooperating with the government and would end up making his sentence worse, so he ordered his hit. After the crime was eventually tied back to him, the prosecutors demanded the capital punishment for Pete. It was eventually agreed that he could have a plea deal as long as it would include a mandatory life sentence. Another big demand the feds had was that because Pistol Pete had ordered some of the hits he pleaded guilty to from jail years earlier, he would have to be placed in solitary confinement 23 hours a day and barred from communicating with anyone from the outside except for his immediate family. After agreeing to the deal in the same courthouse as his father had been imprisoned in years before, Pete was sentenced to three back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back life sentences plus 105 years after pleading guilty to the hits or ordered the hits of six people. Attempting to hit one person and conspiring to hit another two people who were later hit by members of his gang. Around the time of Pete Rolock's sentencing, the authorities distributed posters in the Bronx that included his photograph and the words life without parole to scare away young wannabe gangsters from pursuing the life that had landed Pistol Pete in prison for the rest of his life. In November 2000, 
he was sentenced to the federal supermax prison facility in Florence, Colorado, where 400 of the nation's most infamous criminals are housed, including Ramzi Ahmed Youssef, who led the first attack on the World Trade Center in 93, the Unabomber, and Umar Farouk, the underwear bomber. Tim J. McVeigh, the Oklahoma City bomber, was also held there before being executed in 2001 in Indiana. You would think that, with the conviction to spend the rest of his life alone and behind bars, Pete would have given up on life. But after almost 25 years in isolation at ADX Florence, Pete has spent thousands of hours taking education courses through closed circuit television in a cell. He even earned his GED, and with the help of his family, he self-published his novel, Trigger, described by his lawyer as a cautionary tale for young gangsters. Although his incarceration deal called for a revision of his solitary confinement after 18 months, the Bureau of Prisons deemed him unfit to be let into Gen Pop, and his solitary confinement continues to this day. Unfortunately, Pete hasn't really helped his own case. Before his sentencing in November 2000, he gave an interview to a magazine in which he disclosed the names of former gang members who had snitched on him. Because of his actions, the government had to place several people in the witness protection program. Even though Pete had been isolated from the world since his early 20s, his legacy has endured in the streets of the Bronx and NYC culture as a whole. In recent years, Pistol Pete graffiti has been found all over the Bronx, and during arrest and search of blood members who had nothing to do with Pistol Pete or SMM, the cops have found tons of blood literature that glorify his legendary exploits. It's pretty crazy to think that a guy who spent most of his life in prison left such a lasting legacy on the streets he grew up in, and pretty messed up to realize how he ruined any chance he had at a good life with the mistakes he had made during his youth. But that's what the gang life does to you. Despite the millions of dollars he's believed to have made, Pete's family is still in the streets. He'll pass away in prison, and he spent his only years of freedom being a pawn in the game where no one ever wins. Tragic. As of today, SMM is still active in New York City, though much less powerful than when Pistol Pete was at the head of the organization.